Over the last four years, there have been 27 head coaches hired in the NFL, and just three were black. Three. The bottom line is where, where we are is, 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 is unacceptable. You've been in the room at the owners' meetings when this is discussed. I know you hear the right things, but as African Americans, all of us are used to hearing stuff and knowing bullshit when we hear it. You know, I, I don't know if it is at the time, but I know that the results are. Welcome to The Real Sports Podcast. I'm your host, Max Gershberg. You just heard a clip from Bryant Gumbel's new story on the uphill battle black coaches continue to fight trying to land head coaching jobs in the NFL. Today, the NFL, a league made up of 70% black players, has only three black head coaches. We first covered this issue on Real Sports almost 20 years ago. At the time, an all-star legal team led by Johnny Cochran was threatening to sue the league if they didn't implement better hiring practices. And in all the years since, there's been a lot of talk around this issue, many promises of reform, but very little actual progress. And as you'll hear in Bryant's report shortly, frustration among black coaches continues to mount. Later on today's episode, I'll be joined by Rod Graves. He's the executive director of the Fritz Pollard Alliance, an organization that advocates on behalf of minority coaches. Graves is on the front lines of this fight. He's at the table with Roger Goodell and team owners, and he has unique insight into this glaring lack of diversity in the NFL's coaching ranks. He'll join us to discuss the story and share some thoughts on what he thinks the future may hold. But first, here's Brian Gumbel's latest Real Sports report. It's not equal, based on the numbers. It's not equal. We feel like every time that we reach the playing field, the goal line changes. Well, my father told me, you know, a long time ago uh, that you're going to have to be twice as good. There's one thing to me. You got to change the bias that when I walk in, I'm lesser. The bottom line is where, where we are is, 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 is unacceptable. As the sideline leaders in America's most popular game, NFL head coaches have long been among the most prominent figures in all of professional sports, often the face of a franchise. But for decades, that face was always white. After little progress, prominent civil rights lawyers Cyrus Mary and Johnny Cochran blitzed the NFL and said they'd sue the league if it didn't change its ways, a story we covered in 2002. So people say all the time, well, you know, we need time, Brian. You know what? They've taken the time of our grandparents, our time. They're taking our children's time. It's time to do something about it. The NFL responded with a new rule, mandating that teams interview at least one minority candidate for every open head coaching job. They called it the Rooney Rule, named for the owner of the Pittsburgh Steelers, who was its chief sponsor. When you have the Rooney Rule come into play, you're forcing them to find the best person qualified for the job. It was supposed to usher in the start of a new paradigm, and for a time, it seemed it might, especially when Rooney himself hired a little-known 34-year-old coach named Mike Tomlin. It's a great honor to be a part of uh, one of the most storied franchises in all of professional sports. But in the seasons since the Rooney Rule was instituted, the head coaching numbers have not changed. Although the league has 32 teams, there were three black head coaches 18 years ago, and there are three now. I don't think any of us expected us to be sitting at three it is a global collective failure from, from my perspective. Mike Tomlin has won more games than any black head coach in NFL history. In 2009, he led the Steelers to a Super Bowl title. You've been in the room at the owners' meetings when this is discussed. I know you hear the right things, but as African Americans, all of us are used to hearing stuff and knowing bullshit when we hear it. You know, I, I don't know if it is at the time, but I know that the results are, <laughs> you know. The new head coach of the Jacksonville Jaguars, Urban Meyer. The new head coach of the Detroit Lions, Dan Campbell. The next head coach of the Los Angeles Chargers, Brandon Staley. Amid the parade of new hires, what bothers Tomlin and others is that an extraordinary number of highly qualified and clearly talented black coaches who are already in the pipeline are being constantly overlooked. That pipeline was on full display at the Super Bowl, where three of the four coordinators, the men guiding the offenses and defenses of both teams, were black. 
yet none of them were asked to fill this year's head coaching vacancies. If you're looking for guys who are coordinators, there's examples of that. If you want a guy that's a proven, capable leader, there's Jim Caldwell and, and Marvin Lewis. There's guys like Todd Bowles and Raheem Morris and others. They're capable examples of minority candidates, no matter what the profile. As the NFL's most prominent African-American coach, Tomlin is often a featured speaker at NFL events like this one, diversity workshops for young black coaches. Until now, he has always been an enthusiastic participant. The very existence of those workshops somehow indicates that there is a lack of talent in the minority pool or a lack of readiness, and that is untrue. It leads the public to believe that, oh, this is where guys can actually learn their craft, when in fact, <laughs> guys have already proven their expertise at the craft but can't get the opportunity. Certainly, they're, they're nice fellowship weekends, you know, where we get an opportunity to catch up with one another, but it's not the weekends that they're made out to be. We just can't continue to do the same things that we've done and think that the outcome is going to change. It's not just this year's hiring numbers that are disturbing. Over the last four years, there have been 27 head coaches hired in the NFL, and just three were black. Three. Given the evidence, it would be easy to conclude that the Rooney Rule can't work, but that's not true. According to University of Colorado business professor Stephanie Johnson, some of the country's top CEOs have actually adopted the Rooney Rule and made it work. The ones that are making it work have a authentic desire to create more diversity. It's not someone telling them to do it. It's that they believe it's really improving bottom line outcomes. So an owner needs to be convinced that it's in his best interest to look at an African-American candidate as he would a white candidate. You got it. When more and more studies started coming out showing that there's real benefits in terms of recruitment, retention, then companies really started to take notice. Professor Johnson says it is human nature to hire people who are most like us, but that doing so can be devastating for your business. The more similar we are, the more likely that our mistakes are the same. And that means that I can't see your mistake as an error because I would have said the same exact thing, right? In simplistic terms, if you hired a black guy and I hired a white woman, we'd each learn something we probably couldn't foresee. Exactly. And that's the point, that you couldn't foresee it, right? You don't know what you don't know. Despite such evidence, NFL owners have stuck to an old game plan when it comes to hiring head coaches. And that, in turn, has sent morale among black coaches plummeting to a new low. It's now so bad that this month, football agent Brian Levy convened a Zoom meeting for many of the black coaches he represents to talk about the Rooney Rule. All right, guys. He invited us to record the session. Tim Walton is the quarterback's coach for the Jacksonville Jaguars. You see um, guys that are not as qualified um, that jump ahead of you, guys that you have trained and that were under you for years that, that jump and now, so what is the criteria? You know, the resume doesn't matter anymore. Each and every one of you, I know how hard you work. I know how you guys got to put on a strong front, but I know how much it hurts you. These owners are not budging on it, just to be frank about it. Larry Foote is the outside linebackers coach for the Super Bowl champion Tampa Bay Buccaneers. As a young coach in this league, you're going to hurt young coaches of color just our drive and passion because we know we topped off. We know that we're not going to have a legitimate shot. And we know that you don't, give, you don't do your best. David Overstreet coaches defensive backs for the Indianapolis Colts. You see the black man, you're like, oh, he's the Rooney. That's why he's interviewed. He's, he's the Rooney. He's not getting interviewed because he's the qualified coach. He's getting interviewed because they have to hit that quota. Now you have the weight of the entire race on your shoulders. You have to be representative of everybody. That's not how it should be. It's, it's, it's just ridiculous. It went on like this for more than an hour. Part workshop, part therapy session. Coaches at different stages of their career, all wondering just how much their race might limit their NFL futures. When you approached me about doing this, I said, I have to do it. I have to do everything I can uh, to be a voice for these coaches. Marvin Lewis was the head coach of the Cincinnati Bengals for 16 years. He was fired two years ago, and despite several interviews since then, remains out of the league.
You fall into another category, along with the Leslie Frazier's of the world, which is an African-American head coach who can't seem to get a second chance when the Adam Gazes, the Doug Marones, do get a second chance. Has that hurt? It's, 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 it's wondersome. I guess that's the word I would use. <laughs> it makes you question it. You just had Bruce Arians have another opportunity and, and win the Super Bowl. It, it's great. But he's obviously a few years older than even I am. But he gets that second opportunity. Today, Lewis is assistant to the head coach at Arizona State University, working for Herman Edwards, the former head coach of the New York Jets, who 18 years ago simplified for us the reality of NFL hiring. Who's ever team you work for, that's the owner's company. You're he can do what he wants. Well, basically, I mean, within the rules, I don't think all of a sudden we can start telling people that own football teams how to run their company. I don't think that'll fly. <laughs> we wanted to speak with the NFL, but they declined our request for an interview, referring us instead to recent statements Commissioner Roger Goodell made before the Super Bowl, the same kind of statement he's made year after year after year. It wasn't what we expected, and it's not what we expect going forward. Uh, they're not the outcomes we wanted. Those words are of small consolation to veteran coaches of color like Ray Horton, who wonder if the Rooney Rule ever really offered him anything more than an unrealistic hope. When I walk in, my first thought is, is this a real interview? What's the game plan? What are you stressing? Really, my whole thing was, I am like you. I'm smart, intelligent, engaging, I'm funny, determined. Horton's resume is extensive and exemplary, and he's interviewed with five different franchises, yet he has never been offered a head coaching job. An owner said, Ray, how do I say this to you? And I said, say it as you think it in your head. Okay, I will then, Ray. When I watch you, you're very, and they started searching for a word again, trying not to offend me. Uh, you're very aggressive. And I said, well, how would you like your team to look? Do you cringe when you see some of the guys who get hired and say silly stuff like Dan Campbell said? And when you knock us down, we're going to get up, and on the way up, we're going to bite a kneecap off, all right? Do you sit there and go, my goodness, God, if that was a brother doing that? He, he wouldn't be there. After 34 years in the NFL, as a player and a coach, Horton just finished his first season without pro football and feels he may be done with the NFL. I want the owners to choose who they want to choose. But you'd like them to be forced to be fair. You'd like them to be able to look at two resumes and say, huh, we got one guy here who's got 10 years as a player and 24 years as a coach, and he's been a defensive coordinator in three different places, and huh, we got a guy here who's never been more than a position coach, and he's only got five years. I'll take this guy. Now you're thinking like I think. How do you change that, Bryant? How do you change it? To me, you've got to view me equally. We all know the problem. They don't view me even though I've got a college degree. I've, got, I've been to five Super Bowls. I'm a private pilot. Uh, I can go on and on, but I'm not viewed as equal. Next year, Brian, we're going to be doing this. You'll be doing this with somebody else saying, what can we do? Joining me now is Rod Graves. Rod spent 37 years working in the NFL, and now he's the executive director of the Fritz Pollard Alliance, which means in many ways, Rod is the, the tip of the spear in this fight for more equitable NFL hiring practices. Nobody knows this issue better. Rod, thanks so much for joining us. Max, I'm happy to be on with you, and thank you for inviting me. So Rod, Mike Tomlin called the lack of black NFL coaches a global collective failure. How would you describe the current state of affairs? Well, I agree with Mike uh, and the usage of those terms. It has been a failure. Uh, Max, uh, the hiring process within the NFL is a flawed process. And given the fact that the NFL has been around for over 100 years, it's a billion dollar business, I find it today to be unacceptable uh, that we're our, discussing numbers uh, where we are today with respect to the diversity of leadership. You know, while we can enjoy 
70% of our players participating as African Americans, and yet uh, we're talking numbers of two to three or four at any given year with respect to uh, head coaches, with respect to uh, general managers, and quite frankly, all levels of leadership uh, at the C-suite and uh, even higher. So when Roger Goodell says he's more committed than ever to fixing this problem and creating more opportunity for black coaches, you believe him? Oh, I certainly do. I have a great deal of respect uh, for Roger Goodell and where he is in terms of his efforts to, to try to level the playing field. Uh, he recognizes that we have uh, issues with respect to hiring at the, at the team level. But I also recognize the fact that because of the structure of the league, uh, Roger is not in a position of mandating uh, the hiring practices. That these uh, the solutions are local. The actual hiring takes place at the team level and has to be resolved uh, there uh, as a result. The teams, their only mandate is under the Rooney rule. They have to interview a, a minority coach. But we, as we heard about in Brian's story, you now have this unintended consequence of the quote unquote Rooney rule interview, right? Teams just check in the box. How do you fix that? Well, let's put the Rooney rule in its proper perspective. Uh, first of all, I remember a time, and, and maybe many of you listeners will, when we were deeply concerned about the lack of opportunities that uh, uh, blacks in particular uh, were getting uh, in the interview process. We weren't represented enough uh, in our opinion. The Rooney Rule addressed that and in my opinion has been successful in at least getting us to the table. The responsibility thereafter lies with those who are making the decisions. So Stephanie Johnson, the professor Brian interviewed from Colorado, says money talks and owners aren't going to change how they hire until they think it impacts their bottom line. I know you've suggested the same notion previously. So how does that happen? How do those financial pressures actually get applied? Well, you know, we, we're, everything's on the table at this particular point. Uh, I'm sadly at the point of realizing that these issues uh, affecting the lack of diversity and leadership may not be um, resolvable, if you will, by the league itself. Uh, there may need to be some sort of external pressure put on uh, to really resolve these issues to the level that, that we feel like is necessary. Uh, you know, whether you're talking about legal in involvement, uh, government involvement, uh, involvement by sponsorship, more pressure by sponsors, those sort of things, those are the things that we understand get the owner's attention. It's history. Uh, whenever those forms of stimuli have been put into effect, uh, there has been a positive response. And we may have to go down that route. So just to be clear, when you talk about legal efforts, governmental efforts, there's nothing in the works right now that you can tell us about. But you're saying theoretically, you might need to push those buttons to force change. We're just exploring at this particular point, you know, we're not looking for these emblematic gains year after year and after each year uh, claim some sort of success. We're, we're really looking for proven programs that provide sustainable results. Uh, and when those things are in place, then I think we, we've got something that uh, we think is, is worthwhile. But we're a long ways from that. Uh, and so uh, in order to get there, we may have to create a more serious atmosphere in order to do that. Where does the Players Association come down on this? Where do players come down in their conversations with you? Do they want to be more involved in this discussion moving forward? They've indicated so, Max, but I, I think certainly there's room for uh, more intensified uh, in involvement by our players uh, by our sponsors and, and, and others. Obviously, the players are in a position to disrupt the business model, uh, and, and they can do it immediately. We need to break through the glass ceiling that exists in, in the NFL, and uh, players can certainly help us get there faster. That's certainly a dynamic we've seen in the NBA, right? Player empowerment is alive and well in that league, and often it seems like players have a lot of influence on who coaches, which coaches are hired, which are fired. Do you see more star players using their influence in that way? 
Well, Max, I, I think we're really coming into a new era. And I think that era uh, is going to involve uh, or really realize players as more partners in this business rather than pawns uh, to create a product. Uh, I, I do envision a time when players will uh, want to have more say with respect to who's coaching them, uh, who's running the organizations. Uh, you know, I, I believe that they deserve that. Uh, and what form or fashion, we'll, we'll have to see how it all uh, materializes. But I do envision a bigger role by players. Eric Bieniemy, you know, his two predecessors as the offensive coordinators with the Kansas City Chiefs were quickly hired as head coaches, Doug Peterson and Matt Nagy. He's interviewed, I think now, Rod, with what, close to a third of the league and hasn't gotten his chance. Is his as glaring a case as you can remember? Well, it is, and certainly most recently, but there are others out there. At the end of the day, regardless of whatever issues are pointed out in terms of uh, uh, presentations or, you know, whatever people come up with uh, for reasons that Eric has not been able to attain a job. Uh, to me, the most important aspect is his ability to lead, his ability to articulate in, in that classroom of players, how those players respond to him, and whether or not he can respond to situational football. I believe strongly that Eric can do all of those things. And for that reason, I, I, he's a strong candidate and, and a damn good football coach and should be on the sideline next year as an NFL head coach. As Biennemi once again got passed over this offseason, one guy who did land a head coaching job, Dane Campbell, got the gig in Detroit. Uh, we heard the clip in Brian's piece of his, uh, shall we say, unusual introductory press conference. Let's play it again. When you knock us down, we're going to get up. And on the way up, we're going to bite a kneecap off, all right? And we're going to stand up. And then it's going to take two more shots to knock us down, all right? And on the way up, we're going to take your other kneecap, and we're going to get up. And then it's going to take three shots to get us down. And when we do, we're going to take another hunk out of you. When you're at home watching that, Rod, what's going through your mind? Well, it's colorful, uh, to say the least. But for whatever reasons uh, the Lions saw, uh, in Coach Campbell. I, I'm, I'm not here to throw stones in any way, uh, but uh, I strongly believe that there are candidates out there in the pipeline uh, that uh, who certainly are worthy of providing uh, not only uh, great talent in terms of coaching and, and leadership ability, but can provide uh, more appropriate press conferences as well. Does it strike you as a double standard? Well, there are double standards out there. And when we see uh, coaches and other front office executives get jobs who we believe don't have the experience that, that many of our candidates have, who have not put in the time, uh, who don't have the pedigree, the professional pedigree uh, that uh, uh, many of our candidates have, it does leave you scratching your head about the fairness uh, of the process. We're only asking, Max, that the league live up to its equal uh, employment opportunity uh, policy, and that is to provide fair, open, and competitive interviews. Uh, we're not asking for handouts. We're not asking for the league to reach a certain number. We just want to be able to feel like we, we had an opportunity, we presented our best case, and if the best man ahead of us won based on the merits uh, then we're most likely to applaud that. Uh, but until we feel that the system is fair, uh, then we, we will uh, certainly be working to, to try to change it to create a more level playing field. And right now, in your eyes, it's not a meritocracy. Oh, certainly not. There's a lot that's great about the National Football League. This area is not one of them. This is an area we can improve upon uh, we appreciate the league allowing us a seat at the table to talk about these issues. But we have a long way to go. I, the league, in my opinion, is not proud of their record. Uh, I know that the commissioner is not. And when you look at the fact that it's a hundred year old business worth billions of dollars, uh, this is something that should have been resolved in a more forceful uh, and progressive way. And, uh, and yet we're still lagging behind.
Well, the league and its owners have certainly spent a lot of time and energy of late promoting its commitment to racial justice, promising to do more in that arena. Harder for you to take that at face value, given these issues that still persist in in terms of coaching? Well, let me just say, let me put it this way. We're moving toward a period where we're going to be talking less about social responsibility and more about social performance. Uh, I, I believe people will be coming forth at the local level and asking their teams, what have you done in this area and what are you planning to do? I believe that uh, on a yearly basis that they're going to have to answer questions to a generation that is not afraid to ask why or why not. Uh, at some point, we're going to produce through the Fritz Pollard Alliance a report card uh, that really addresses the, the hiring practices for every club. And uh, with that, uh, you know, we'll be able to add to the conversation and add scrutiny to those teams that are performing well and those who are not. If that report card was out now, what would be the grade point average of the class? (laughs) Well, in this area, they'd be failing. Okay. Last question for you, Rod. The Rooney Rule is coming up on 20 years old, but as Brian's piece pointed out, We have three black coaches in the NFL today, the same number that were in place the year the Rooney Rule was instituted. Will we be any further along 20 years from now? Not if we're dependent on the Rooney Rule. Until we do more to uh, really get a commitment from ownership to change the landscape, I don't care what policies out there that are out there, they will not work and they will not get us to levels that are acceptable in terms of of the fair, competitive, and open process argument that I I stated earlier. I appreciate the Rooney Rule. I'd rather have it than not have it. Uh, But let's not put the responsibility of employment gains on the Rooney Rule. It's the people that are making the decisions. Rod, we will certainly continue to watch it play out and see how the league and its owners navigate these issues. Uh, Thank you so much for coming on to talk about it. We appreciate it. Max, thanks for having me. And of course, that is just one of the stories from this month's episode of Real Sports. Here's what else you'll see on the latest show. David Scott examines the role youth sports have had in spreading the coronavirus, even as schools have remained closed and group gatherings of all sorts have shut down. The $17 billion youth sports industry has carried on with its games and its travel, much to the dismay of public health officials who believe our kids' sporting events have exacerbated the pandemic. And John Frankel travels across the globe to meet the Iceman, extreme athlete Wim Hof, who's become a legend for his cold water immersion and breathing techniques that have allowed him to climb the world's biggest mountains in nothing but shorts, run a marathon in the desert without water. And now some researchers actually believe Wim Hof's methods can have remarkable health benefits too. He's a fascinating guy, and that's a crazy story you won't want to miss. Reminder, you can catch those stories and all recent episodes of Real Sports with Brian Gumbel on HBO Max. And that'll do it for today's Real Sports podcast. I'm your host, Max Gershberg. Thanks for listening, and please join us again next time. Mm